Welcome to the Bright Vibe Podcast. At Bright Vibe, we believe everyone deserves to be happy. But in today's world, everywhere you turn, there is division and negativity. At Bright Vibe, we have created a global movement to bring 8 million people together who are inspired to live bright, live bold, and share bright vibes. Alone, it can be hard to change, but together we can change the world. Welcome to the Bright Vibe Podcast. Tara J. Frank, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for coming on. So you just released a book uh, very recently, uh, The Waymakers, Clearing the Path to Workplace Equity with Competence and Confidence. And my first question for you today is, what is a waymaker? We're going right in. Aren't We're we? going right in. We, we don't we don't mess around on this show. It's like let's get <laughs> to right. it. Well, I'll, we'll start there and then we'll back our way in. But I always like to know what the heck is a waymaker. I love it. Well, it is the big question. Um, so, here's what I will say about that. You know, every I work in workplace equity, mm-hmm. so I essentially help companies, leaders at a high level. Uh, better understand their current workplace culture, imagine a preferred culture, and then build the bridge between those two points, right? Okay. And what I really try to help them do is ensure they have a workplace where every single person has an opportunity to win, you know, to mm-hmm. thrive, to contribute. So as I reflected, you know, every black and brown person, every woman, mm-hmm. et cetera, those who exist on dimensions of difference, who made it to the top of their game, mm-hmm. however they define game, did so not only because of systems change, which we tend to talk a lot about when it comes to equity, but also because somebody made a way for them. Oh, okay. Like full stop, right? Mm-hmm. Somebody saw them, saw the light in them, reflected that light back to them, uh, asked them what they aspire to, opened doors, removed barriers. So a way maker is a leader with a heart to lead. Mm -hmm. and a heart to lead equitably who opens doors for other people and ushers them through to higher levels of contribution on purpose. That's interesting. Where did you get that term Waymaker? I've heard that, but is there some historical origin behind Waymaker or is that? Well, it's in the Bible. Oh, that Um, there we go. See, I was right. (laughs) There is a historical connection. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I heard you tell a story about a vine earlier, and I picked up on that in one of your in your in your one of your videos. But waymaker, I did not. Yes. Okay. So yes, our elder waymaker. Yes. Okay. There we go. I'm 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 picking up. There we go. Making the way. So biblical, but you were going somewhere else with that story. Not only biblical, but it's not only biblical. It's also practical. You know, I I think we don't get anywhere alone at the Mm -hmm. end of the day, right? right? When we're able to succeed and make amazing things happen with our creativity and our talents and our experiences, we do that not only by our own merit, but because other people see the potential in us Mm -hmm. and they make that connection maybe that we needed to be made. Or again, they open that door or they figure out what's in the way, what's standing between us and our dreams and they collaborate with us to remove those those blockages. And so we've all had waymakers. Mm-hmm. Uh, many of us have had the opportunity to be one. And what I'm essentially doing is inviting many more people in workplaces to make a way for many more people. Mm-hmm. And really, we're and when we say many more people, really being, I'm assuming you're saying diversity and also being open to new ideas. Because typically, when you look at yeah. successful companies you know, they're usually successful over decades because of their ability to adapt and change, right? It's not that they just made the same widget over and over for, uh, you know, 200 years, right? So absolutely, you know, the when we talk about what's happening in the workplace today, and of course, diversity, equity and inclusion has been a big topic Mm -hmm. over the last several years, right? We're really, we've really not made the kind of progress we say we want to make. And Mm -hmm. I believe that's because we sometimes spend too much time talking about it as a theory, talking about it as a strategy or a set of, um, I'll I'll say tactics. Mm -hmm. And we forget the human element of this, that people implement systems, that people, right, Mm -hmm. practice policies, that people hold up our ideals uh, and live out our values. And so, I believe that if more people were equipped and inspired to lead uh, in ways that create more opportunity for those who have been left behind, right, for Mm -hmm. those who have been historically advantaged, that we would have more open pathways uh, to the equitable workplace we say we want. So absolutely, it's not only about, hey, everybody deserves an opportunity to be their best and to do their best inside the workplace, 
But the more we enable that, the more, to your point, views we have on a business problem, right? The more angles mm -hmm. uh, we can look at, you know, opportunities through and ultimately create, I believe, more vibrant outcomes for our businesses and for the people that we serve. Hmm. So uh, in, in a culture, and I, and I think we could say, uh, you, you know, you, certainly you work in the business culture space, but I think culturally, even in any culture, I guess, what's the big blocks to um, not being more diverse? Is it just ingrained historical, this is the way it's always been? Or what do you run into when you're dealing with organizations and, and communities? Yeah, there are a few reasons why I believe we're stuck. Mm -hmm. I think the first is that culture exists on three levels. You have the claim, the policy, and the norm. So the claim is what we say about ourselves, the policy, you know, the rules we put in place to reinforce those claims. But then the norms are really how we show up every single day, the choices we make, the behaviors we exhibit. I think sometimes we stop at claim and then policy, mm -hmm. and we don't really fully investigate or interrogate our norms and hold ourselves to new norms that might create more opportunity. I think another thing happening here is we tend to mind our own business a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, we may see something happening over to the left that we think is a little off, you know, or mm -hmm. could be handled differently. But we're so good inside our workplaces at just saying, well, that's not my business. You know, that's my peers business. I'm going to let them deal with that. And for everything we notice and don't say anything about, there's an opportunity lost, right? Mm -hmm. There's there's an insight that somebody is not able to gain. And then the other thing at play here is really about power. I mean, let's be honest, in any given entity, there are people in the center who hold most of the power mm -hmm. and in the middle, you have the insight, which is sometimes unwritten rules, sacred cows. You have access you know, to power networks, to knowledge centers, and you have opportunity. And all that good stuff is in the center held by the people who have the power. And the only folks who, who normally intuitively benefit from that are those who most closely reflect those in power, because those are the people we surround ourselves with naturally every single day. Mm -hmm. So if you're very different from the people in power, then you're really far removed from that insight, access, and opportunity. And we all need those things in order to create and sustain healthy careers. Hmm. So can you give us an example of, I guess, kind of somebody, some a company or a community or, or an organization you worked with that kind of here was kind of where they were at so we can be clear. Here's kind of where they were at. Here's where they were stuck. And then here's actually what they did kind of to kind of like a mini case study, if that's okay. Of, yeah, for of, sure. Of, of like kind of so that we can start to have an understanding because I'm just trying to get it clear in my own mind. Okay, how would, how in, in my own, in the organizations I'm involved in, how would we? Uh, be, yeah, how does it translate? Yeah, yeah, how does it translate? For sure. So there are three main steps and I'll share with you a case study, you know, through this example. So the first is what I just call to embrace realism. And what mm -hmm. that means to me is getting an honest assessment of your current workplace culture today. Mm -hmm. So companies can look at their existing data, you know, their pay data, their promotion data, their retention data, their exit data to try to understand how equitable or inclusive they are at the moment but they should also get a better sense of the employee experience. So I'll share with you one company I worked with. They had done engagement surveys, you know, they had all their data pulled and they were basically like, well, from what we understand, people generally feel that this was an equitable and inclusive environment. Our uh, inclusion score in our sentiment survey was really high. Well, I actually ran an experience survey with them mm -hmm. and an experience survey, meaning asking questions, have you or have you not experienced X? And it was things like, uh, I don't get feedback until it becomes a barrier to advancement mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. I don't really know what it takes to get to the next level mm -hmm. or I don't believe anyone above me even really understands what I do. Mm -hmm. So those are the kinds of moments, inflection points that create an experience, right? An employee experience. And those things dictate the quality of that relationship between the employee and the employer. So really understanding what people are experiencing 
is a first critical step. Now, once this company did better understand what their folks were experiencing, and in this case, we were focusing on multicultural women and their experiences at work, once they did understand that, they felt a lot more um, inspired and I'll say uh, dedicated, mm -hmm. right? To figuring out how to unlock some of these kinks in the system. So we brought them together, the leaders and the multicultural women across levels, across all dimensions of difference to build empathy, like first of all, so that they could better understand what their multicultural women were experiencing. We then took them through an innovation exercise, right? Where they looked at different talent processes mm -hmm. and through multiple lenses. So what really works about this talent process? What doesn't, what do we wish were true? What are we concerned about? And those are the kinds of insights they then use to collaboratively come up with surprising solutions and take bolder action. Mm -hmm. So for me, as a product developer, I'm all about, do we really understand the problem, mm -hmm. you know, or the opportunity? And once we do, how can we use that insight to uh, come up with surprising solutions that we can try to implement, we can experiment with, uh, we should do that collaboratively with people who have different viewpoints and then figure out how we're going to measure whether or not we're doing the right thing, you know, and if not, how we refine it. Hmm, interesting. And so, so you're diving deeper into kind of the underlying what's really going on versus just what looks good on a survey, it sounds like. Right, um, or what people say, because sometimes you can say, are you happy at work? And if somebody you. says, yes, I'm happy at work, does that tell you anything at all about how no. to make them happier? No, oh, right, exactly. <laughs> and so this seems uh, sort of like a 360 analysis or a 360 review to some degree, but really looking at what's really happening a lot probably with yeah. the communication process, I'm assuming, in, in an organization. Thank you for listening to the Bright Vibe podcast today. We've got a special event coming up here shortly, July 12th through the 16th, called the Global Happiness Summit. And we're bringing resources from around the country together to talk about happiness and what that means and how to have more of that in our lives. Go to brightvibe.com, B-R-I-T-E, vibe, V-I-B-E.com for more information about the Global Happiness Summit. And we look forward to seeing you July 12th through the 16th. Some of it, yeah, but some of it also about the assumptions we make, um, about the questions we don't ask, about the uh, scaffolding we provide to some people and not to others, right? Mm -hmm. Like some of this is really just we operate according to our intuition, according to our gut, and our guts can be really narrow. Right. You know, we don't all have a, a very broad lens in terms of how we define leadership or how we define uh, success and, and it can sometimes be based on our limited view of the world. Mm -hmm. When we do that, we leave so many people and so much opportunity uh, out of out of the, the you know, conversation. Certainly. Yeah. And so what, uh, you know, I guess what made you want to get into or makes your life, your life's work, literally written a book and everything to prove that it's your life's work. How did, um, <laughs> how did you, how did you get there? I guess what, what was the catalyst? I found usually when I'm visiting with people that there's usually one or two catalysts or, or, or major points in life where a decision was made and maybe it took years for that decision to play out or that, uh, to finally come to fruition of, oh yeah, this is why I'm doing this. But for you, kind of what made you want to work in the workplace, I guess, with um, work, what you, what you phrase as workplace, workplace equity, but really what was that for you? Yes, this is such a good question, by the way. For me, it was one recognizing that there was a thread in my entire career mm -hmm. um, that I was able to kind of recognize and pull. And then the other was certainly a catalyst um, moment. So I worked at Hallmark Cards for 21 years. Mm -hmm. I started as a greeting card writer. I grew up in writing and editorial and ultimately became the vice president of creative writing and editorial. I then led business innovation for a while. Mm -hmm. I designed and stood up a multicultural center of excellence. And then my last role at Hallmark was as corporate culture advisor. Now, what I what was a common thread through all of that was the Hallmark is a relationship business. Right. So really deeply understanding 
how people relate to one another, what they need from other people, what they hope, right, for mm -hmm. um, from other people, what deepens relationships, strengthens them, repairs them, etc. Mm -hmm. So that's something I have very deep expertise in, obviously, but I was also always just super passionate about talent, like mm -hmm. unleashing talent. Does mm -hmm. everyone have what, the, do they know what they need to know? Do they have what they need to have, right? Mm -hmm. Are they inspired by what they need to be inspired by in order to grow and, and really contribute at their highest possible level? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that came true for me because whatever job I was doing functionally, I always loved the leading part the most. Right. <laughs> so yeah. that was the thread all uh -huh. the way through. But what happened in my personal life is I was living in Kansas City. I was gonna, I was I was, I was yeah. going to ask you about that. So if you don't mind a little side note yeah, here. Sure. Did, did you know Gordon McKenzie? I didn't know him personally, but of okay. course I know of Gordon McKenzie. Of Everybody who at worked Hallmark. at Hallmark. Yes. Yeah. So so his daughter was in my wedding. She was the bride. Really? The, yeah, yeah. My my wife and, and his daughter are very close friends and have been since childhood. So so when I heard we you We all were, read his book. Yeah, of course. So when I heard you were coming on today, I was like, Remind me who, who Heather's dad is and she was like, Oh yeah, Gordon McKenzie. I was like, Well, I'm gonna ask and I wondered if you actually lived in Kansas because I'm we're based out of Wichita. And so, yes. you know, we're three hours. 17 years wow. I lived there. So I can't say. So I, I didn't mean to interrupt your story, but I just wanted no. to see if, yeah. So you obviously knew who he was. So, so yes. Yeah. So, so you're living in Kansas City. So yeah, living in Kansas City, I was uh, in the succession plan for corporate officer. So I had been mm -hmm. working toward, you know, that, that C-suite for a bit. And then um, I was, I had gone through a divorce. Mm -hmm. I reconnected, you know, with someone I knew in college, we decided mm -hmm. we wanted to get married and blend our families. And it necessitated a move mm -hmm. from Kansas City to Texas. And mm -hmm. that was the catalyst because I had my career all planned out. You know, I, right. if I had stayed in Kansas City, I planned to retire from Hallmark. That's kind of what I had mm -hmm. in my head. I'm just gonna keep this party moving right. till I don't wanna work anymore. Um, it was great work. It's, it's a great company, great people. And then um, when I knew I had to move to Texas, things really shifted because I couldn't operate at that level and not live in Kansas City, not with the work that I was doing because mm -hmm. Hallmark is a very community centric mm -hmm. company. It's privately owned and right. deeply entrenched in the community. Right. So because of the kind of work I do, it wasn't gonna work for me to do it remotely. Mm. And I just had to rethink, what am I gonna do now, right? Which made me basically ask myself, what am I passionate about? What mm -hmm. am I good at? Mm -hmm. What do I believe my professional purpose is? Mm -hmm. And when I started connecting some of those dots, I recognized that leadership development and then ultimately culture work uh, was where I believed I could make the most impact. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, and I always, I always love in in every backstory. There's that. Uh, I'm sure there's um, stuff around the divorce, and stuff around the move, and stuff around getting remarried, and then you say blending of families. I think you've got six kids between the two of you, right? Mm -hmm. So, so the blending of families, and I'm just like, there's all kinds of fun stuff there. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> meaning, meaning. Lots of life. <laughs> well, yeah, lots, lots of life. And I would, I would, I would also guess um, lots of introspection to your point, questioning, what am I good at? What am I passionate about? Yes. And then having the confidence to do something with that, right? It's one thing to say, you know, it's, it's one thing to go through something, whether you want to or not, like the, you know, the death of a family member or divorce mm -hmm. or, or, you know, the a, a company not going the way you think it should go or whatever that may be. But then it's another to embrace that lean in and, and use that as a catalyst for positivity, right? Because if you would have stayed at Hallmark, I guess I'm just connecting all the dots here. So if you would have stayed at Hallmark, I'm guessing that this book never gets written. If that's... Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think so. I right. really don't think so. I think I would have just been leading, you know, at those various levels. Right. And that would have, I mean, that, I, that would have kept me busy enough, right? right? Hopefully satisfied enough. And I don't think the book gets written. I, right. I really don't. And, you know, the good news is there are skills. I, I am an introspective person to mm -hmm. a fault. Mm -hmm. Like, I think a lot about what I'm thinking. So, you know, there are, there are good things and bad things about that. Okay. I think we can all probably acknowledge it. It sounds like you not um, only have kids, you have apparently uh, little ones, little, little tiny kids. I have kids. a menagerie. Yeah. 
I apologize. Of course, the landscapers always come at the most opportune oh, yes. time. I love it. I love all this working um, from home stuff. I put my dog I on know. camera sometimes. Like, what kind of dog do you have? <laughs> I've got a, we've got a two of them, but the one that always gets on camera because he's taller is we've got a uh, golden doodle. And, you know, they're big, furry, moppy looking. Everybody says, what a good looking dog. And I'm like, I don't think he's good looking at all. He looks like a giant gold mop to me, but he's very lovable. The kids love him. You know, the family loves him, but he's tall enough so he can kind of get his head right into the screenshot. Not, he's not here at the office, but at home. So sounds like they stopped working though. Oh, you just muted. Well, well no, oh. I just <laughs> muted myself for a minute. They, um, they, I have a golden doodle too. Oh, do you really? Did you? Yeah, so ours, ours was supposed to be the mini, but he's the size of a horse. He's the size of a small horse. It's like both of his parents were minis. They guaranteed he's like got the registration and he got the digestive tract to prove that he's an authentic purebred dog. But then he's a. Uh, but yeah, no, he's like huge. He's like literally, he, he stands and puts his paws on my shoulders. I'm six foot tall. He puts his paws right here. He's, his head is almost as tall as my head. I'm like, how is that even possible? I feel like we're living the same life because <laughs> our golden doodle was supposed to be a mini as well. Is and right? he's, fi he's 50 pounds. Yeah. And because mm -hmm. their arms are so long, he yeah. is also super, super tall. tall. But yeah, we also have a Doberman and a yeah. little 10 pounder. But yeah. They don't like landscapers. At all. <laughs> They're very good at protecting you from nothing. <laughs> from right. people that you, right? You, people that, and, and, and then, and then I, I guarantee, if somebody was trying to break in the middle of the night, they'd just sleep through it. Probably they'd they just totally be like, would. They <laughs> they'd would be like, wait, them to death. right? It's like, well, no, he didn't drive up in a truck, and he doesn't have like a weapon, like some type of leaf blower. So yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, yes. But it's, um, you know, I, I was just saying that I am really, I'm an introspective person, yeah, yeah. like. I think a lot about what I'm thinking and why I'm thinking it. And right. I think we can probably both admit that that is a blessing and a curse. curse. Yes, definitely. For <laughs> every, the blessing, for everyone, yeah. yeah, for everybody. But the blessing in it is I've kind of kept tabs all along, you know, on mm -hmm. what I really love to do. Right. And what inspired me and what um, made me feel alive and like I was making a difference. And so when the game changed, mm -hmm. I had a, a general sense of the kind of impact I wanted to have and how I might just start, you know, pouring myself into that and seeing mm -hmm. if I could make something of it. Pe people say, when did you know you wanted to be an entrepreneur? And I'm like, <laughs> uh, I didn't want to be right. an entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah. Today or is today the right, right. Yeah, like right. that, that day that yeah. I became one, one right. you know, it is, is the day. And so we all have a little bit of a different story there, but that's, that's mine. Yeah. And so what did that look like then in the beginning for you? So you, you have this passion, you have this, um, Thing that you believe people w can benefit from did you just reach out to some of your corporate contacts did you i mean what was that kind of because i think that's for for people leaning I, more and more on this show we talk about purpose and finding your purpose and leaning into your purpose but you know that's hard it's it's hard i mean it's hard at any stage of life i think when you're evaluating and being introspective about what you want to do and and then thinking okay now what do i do with that i mean i may be the best uh, you know, embroid. Uh, I don't even know if an embroiderer is that. I don't even think of it. Well, <laughs> skip something. Else. I may be the best, you know, chef and or a cook or whatever, or yodeler or whatever. But then, what do I do with that? So, what did you do with that? Once you kind of had that passion, what did you? How did you take it from there? Yeah. Well, the good news is, I had been in product development my entire career. Ah, gotcha. I had been in business innovation, you know, for several years, and so the process of stepping back to say, what do people really need right now? Um, what do I believe I can uniquely right, bring to this space to make a difference? And how do I start giving shape to that, right? Mm -hmm. Through yeah. a vision and a set of principles and products or solutions is something that was not foreign to me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something I had always done. So I really just started approaching it the way I approached product development, right? right? By, by first better understanding what people needed and then mm -hmm. figuring out how I could go about experimenting um, to, to start to deliver some of that. But the other thing I really had to do, when you work at a company like Hallmark, which is very familial, right? your, your network is pretty insular. Mm -hmm. You know, like I grew up there. I was an intern wow. between my junior and senior year of college. So right. I had been there since I was 20. Mm -hmm. I only knew other hallmarkers. You know, I didn't really have 
a very broad network outside those walls. So the very first thing I started doing, honestly, was building a network on LinkedIn. You know, oh, I've been gotcha. on LinkedIn mm -hmm. for over a decade and I just started building community because mm -hmm. I knew that I would need to know more people and to learn more things than I had learned inside, you know, those four walls. So that was number one. And mm -hmm. then just starting to kind of test out certain ideas or, or potential solutions with people to see if they would find it meaningful mm -hmm. um, or, or high impact. When I started, I was doing coaching yep. and I was doing uh, training mm -hmm. and I was doing some speaking. Mm -hmm. And I learned probably after six months that I did not want to do coaching anymore. So mm -hmm. the entrepreneurial journey is also just really, I think, you have to be agile. You have to pay attention mm -hmm. to what works for you and what works for other people and be willing to make adjustments, you know, along the way. Right. Definitely. And so what do we find in the, in the book itself? I have not read the book. I will say that I'll be the first to admit that, but it just came out recently. So I hope you will. I, well, now I have to. <laughs> do you reference the, the uh, golden doodle in it at all? Is there a golden doodle reference in the book? I think in my bio, it says that we have three dogs. I, did I, think, that, I okay. think that's the extent of it. Well, you know, golden doodle uh, owners are kind of like, like, loyal to golden doodle like stuff so you might mention the we golden know doodle why though right yeah they're level they're they're really good dogs except you can't feed them anything except the one food otherwise they i don't know about yours but our, ours is like yeah i've got one dog that's a mutt from the kennel she can eat anything i watched her eat tinfoil one day didn't phase her a bit it had some like <laughs> grease on it and she just ate it and i was like no 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 she ate nothing no problem this thing eats just like a, anything that's slightly off i could give it a, a, like anything that's slightly off and automatically that dog gets sick. I don't know. Any, it's just strange. Maybe yours isn't the same way. But He's not as sensitive not with as his finicky. stomach, thankfully, because he eats things that aren't food. Yes. Yeah. That's the, all the time. Yes. That's the problem <laughs> with ours as well. Um, so what's in the book? Uh, what's in the book? I mean, one, who's it written for? And then kind of mm -hmm. what's in it? Yeah. So the book is written. I wrote it initially. Here's an interesting little mm -hmm. thing for high level leaders, leaders with power and position mm -hmm. in companies right. who wanted to create more inclusive cultures, but did not know what to do mm -hmm. and didn't know how to do it. Right. So it is somewhat of a guidebook, right? Mm -hmm. Like it starts by helping people understand why we're stuck, why we've not made more progress. Um, it gives people the tools they need and the information they need to do a climate assessment. So, mm -hmm. you know, understanding what people are experiencing. It tells people what your talent really wants from you. Like everybody at work just wants to be seen, respected, valued, and protected. Mm -hmm. We did a proprietary body of research with a company called Brand Trust, where we asked hundreds of employees to tell us stories of times they felt seen, respected, valued, mm -hmm. and protected, and tell us stories of times they felt the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. And we learned so much about what leaders and peers, quite frankly, do every single day, the choices they make and behaviors they exhibit mm -hmm. that make people feel included and those that make them feel excluded. Mm -hmm. So there's some really practical, you know, insightful guidance about mm -hmm. how leaders can show up day to day to make a way for other people. There are Waymaker principles in there. Have you ever read, um, I know you're a reader, have you read Ray Dalio's book, Principles? I've got the book. I've read about the first three chapters and then I went on to another book. So yeah. <laughs> he's probably, I've brought this yeah. book up so many times yeah, yeah, that he's yeah. probably going to call me and be like, you owe me some money. But <laughs> I loved the book really when I think about diversity, equity, and inclusion because I think it requires you to lead through principles and mm -hmm. not by rules. Like people want the rules all the time. They ask me, well, what's the manual? What do I say and not say? What do I do and not do? And I try to get them away from that because this is human centric work mm -hmm. and there is no one right answer, but there are principles, right? That if you lean into them and lead according to them, you can create the kinds of climates where everybody feels they have an opportunity to do their best work. And that's really um, at the heart of way making. So those are some of the things in there. We also have a chapter about um, business outcomes, mm -hmm. you know, the talent outcomes leaders can reasonably expect when they make people feel seen, respected, valued and protected. So it's it's pretty well researched. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of stories in there because I do this work in addition to researching the work. Mm -hmm. 
And I think it's an, an insightful, inspiring, and most important practical guide uh, to helping people make a way. Right. And, and that's so important. I think it just as, you know, this world's evolving so fast just with technology and, you know, working remotely and just, you know, one, th- I mean, every day it's like something new is coming. I'm just like, wow, that's a thing. I didn't even know that that would be a thing. Um, so I think more and more, where do those good ideas come from? It's not from the stereotypical way that we used to process information or the way we used to share information or market info, right? It's, it's so much more organic now. It is. You, 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 I think as a, as, a, as a business owner or a business leader, if you're not listening to that stuff, you're already falling behind, right? If you're not, if you're not harvesting ideas and, and opening up those channels of communication with everybody at all, all stakeholders, right, that are attached to any, any organization, then you're, you're going to be behind because somebody else is going to listen. I mean, that's the big, that, big difference now, right? It, before, yes. maybe nobody was listening, like in the 60s or 70s or 80s or maybe right. even 90s. Nobody was listening because there was enough money and there was enough stuff driving. But now it's shifted like if, if you're not inclusive, you're behind, right? I mean, you, you're, you are. And I love that point because people have asked me, you know, did is your book about diversity? And mm-hmm. I'm like, not really. It's a leadership book mm-hmm. because in my opinion, leaders of the future, if they're not leading inclusively, they will not be able to lead. Right. 88% of Generation Z mm-hmm. says that diversity and inclusion is very important to them right. when choosing a place to work. I mean, think about that. Right. So if, if we're not figuring this out, if we're not really taking the work seriously, then we won't be able to attract talent and we certainly won't be able to keep talent. So in my opinion, it's, it's not just a nice to do, mm-hmm. it's a sustainability play uh, in addition to it just being, you know, the, the right thing to do. Well, and I think from that, you know, as uh, to add on to that per- perspective, I think, you know, that's what we're seeing with what they call what now the great resignation or whatever. Um, I mean, right. I think that's exactly what's happening. I think it's spreading across all age groups. It's kind of like, well, if, if they don't value what I think and they don't value what I what I can contribute, then I'm just not going to work there anymore. Right. And I'm, right. I'm going to find someone who does, I'm going to find someone who does, or I'll just go create a space, a freelancer, or, you know, so many people, like I said, can work remotely now and do those things that it's like, I'm just not going to, I guess there's almost a certain level of, you know, if a company's kind of BSing about their inclusion policies, um, they, they really, People are just like, no, I'm going to vote with my talent and I'm just going to take it somewhere else. Um, and we're yes. seeing that across all industries. That's not just a, um, you know, service industry or whatever. I think that's we're seeing that. And I think that's a very positive thing. Right. We've got to be more balanced in the world. So. Well, it raises the bar, you know, for all of us. And if you think about it in every single dimension of business, we've had to rethink how we work and how we go to market. And this is really no different, right? The culture Mm -hmm. should be part of that uh, redefining, part of that reimagination. I, you know, there was a time when I was first in the workplace um, 20 something years ago, (laughs) where it was a lot more command and control. When you were 16. When I was just a wee, wee Tara. You said you interned, right? (laughs) Exactly, a, a wee Tara. You know, it was command and control back then. Right. Like, we're the leaders. These are the rules. This is how we operate. If you don't like it, you don't have to be here. You know, I'm not suggesting that was the spirit of the company I worked for, but that's just the way it was in the workplace. Exactly. Yep. And it's not like that anymore. Mm -hmm. We we are, I say, you know, we're squarely in the collaborate and cultivate era. People want to do the work, not just for us, but alongside us. Right. They want to create the future that they are interested in contributing to. And if we don't know how to do that, if we don't know how to open those doors and bring people along, we are going to be left behind, to your point. Yeah, and that's every level. And then when you say like leaders and CEOs, leaders, yeah. and uh, really that's that's everybody in an organization, right? Because everybody right. can lead. I've you know I've been involved in several organizations. I'm kind of an entrepreneur, serial entrepreneur. And so... Um, you know, I've, I've watched people become leaders that didn't have titles, right? They just became mm-hmm. leaders because they, they influence. had the right, right influence. And they, they just did, uh, you know, I, I watched a young gal in one of our organizations. She was like, literally went from like being kind of a cleaning type person and kind of just helping. She had a degree that was a, more advanced than that, but she was kind of mm-hmm. cleaning and kind of helping out to eventually just basically running the culture for that company just because she had the heart for it. So it wasn't that she was given a, 
a, a title. It's she, she stepped up and said, hey, this is important. I'm going to do this really kind of without asking permission, just kind of said this is the right thing to do. And it was like, yeah, that is the right thing to do. So, I, I, you know, I, when we talk about leadership, I think I think sometimes there's the confusion of, well, they have a title and they're the, you know, this manager or this director. And it's like, no, everybody's a leader. Every, everybody yeah. on the face of the planet is a leader to someone. Even if it's just to yourself, you have to lead yourself. So how inclusive are you being in your thoughts and in your friends and in your, you know, uh, social circles? I mean, it's not just at work, right? It's not, I, I, would, I would hate to think that this is just a box we check for work, right? Agree, agree. I mean, you know, this isn't rocket science, but I tell people all the time, we are, we are people first, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. we are people at home, we are people at work, we are the same person. And so, you know, that goes to also sometimes people are like, well, that's happening outside these walls, we can't control that. And I always say, well, you can't control it, but you have to account for it. Mm -hmm. Because right. people, as much as we might want them to, they don't enter the workplace and all of a sudden shed every single thing that happens to them <laughs> when they're not in the workplace. Right. So some of us enter the workplace with a little bit of a burden, yes, you know, a course. social or emotional burden. And people who work with us, people who, you know, manage us, people who report to us, I think need to understand that, that that humanity, especially these days, mm -hmm. you know, to something you mentioned earlier, um, it, people are carrying a lot of weight. Yep. People have have lost, you know, loved ones. People mm -hmm. have um, their whole entire world, right? The way they're accustomed to working has been shaken up. Mm -hmm. And so we're all trying to figure out how to move forward in the future in a meaningful and sustainable way. If we do that together, we'll be much better off. Yes, I, I totally agree. And so what's what's your hope with the book? You know, you're... you're um, very passionate driven person. So I guess what, what's your hope for the book and the message as it moves forward, kind of obviously reaching, probably reaching people, but what's that when, when you yeah. dream, you're introspective. So when you dream, where does, where does this thing go? Well, are you ready for this? I uh, am. It, I said, <laughs> it goes I, very I, far. Right. I okay. Was, so we didn't talk about I'll this pre-show. I'm literally doing this I off know. the cuff. <laughs> here's what I'll say first. Yes. Any major change we go through, you're always going to have 20% of the people on the front end, like, let's go, let's change 20% ish on the back end saying, you know, I don't want to change, don't touch my stuff. Mm -hmm. And then about 60% of the people in the middle sitting on the fence, watching, you know, waiting, trying to figure out if they have something they should be doing. And if so, what? And the Waymakers was written as an invitation to that 60%. Oh, okay. To say, get off the fence and into this arena. I'm going to show you how, and I'm going to give you the inspiration and the encouragement uh, to do it well, because we do not get to more diverse, equitable, and inclusive workplaces without that 60%. Right. Until they tip, right. nothing changes. We have this conversation 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. So my highest hope is to equip and inspire 1 million Waymakers if the, each of them made a way for three more people, right. uh, we would transform our workplaces for good. Hmm. I love it. See, see, I wasn't scared of that at all. I think that's a very <laughs> valiant, valiant goal. There's no scary stuff there. <laughs> the, uh, um, well, I appreciate you coming on today. How do people stay uh, connected with you, the, the book? I mean, qu kind of what's the best way to learn more about your work? And then if they, if they do want to uh, visit with you about working with them in the workplace, kind of what's that look like? Yeah, so my website is tarajfrank.com, T-A-R-A-J-A-Y-E-F-R-A-N-K. If they want to work with me, that's the best place to go. Um, but I'm also really active on LinkedIn mm -hmm. uh, under Tara J. Frank. I share a lot of perspectives there and certainly keep people updated. I'm also on Twitter and Instagram, but LinkedIn and my website are the best ways to get in touch with me. Perfect. Well, I'm sure we'll have people that want to reach out and visit with you and take this conversation further. So I certainly thank you for coming on. And as things progress, please come back on the show and update us and highlight us and let us know uh, how things are progressing and what's what's new in your world. So anytime anything that you w would like to, to discuss, certainly feel reach out and let us know and we'll be happy to have you back on. 
Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. It's been so fun hanging out with you. And thank you for your grace when my dogs <laughs> told the landscapers to go goodbye. Yes. Well, I'm just glad that you're there. Those three dogs are protecting you. I feel much better and feel better about the world that I know you're being protected by these three vicious, vicious animals. So please don't vicious. go vicious animals. So don't go down to Dallas unannounced. Don't go out down without an invitation. <laughs> At least Bad to your idea. house. Yeah. You've got these attack dogs. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, my friend. Thank you. You have a beautiful day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you for being a part of the Bright Vibe podcast. For more information, go to brightvibe.com. That's B-R-I-T-E, vibe, V-I-B-E.com. Thank you for listening.